eyes in prayer. We're grateful, Lord, that you indeed raised us up because Christ was raised up on the cross, raised up from a life of hopelessness and despair, of sin, of failure. You raised us up, Lord, to be with Christ. Now we're in the heavenlies. Now we set our minds and our hearts on things above, no longer in things below, because we are people of hope. We thank you for Christ, who was raised up on the cross, and who died for our sins. We're grateful forever. And we're grateful for your word for us this morning, Father, and we commit this word, and I commit myself to you. May you accomplish your purpose for which you send your word to your people today, in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Now, there are two fixed points in our lives, our birth and our death. And this is illustrated in almost all uh, tombstones in a cemetery. Now, if you notice in the tombstone engraved is the date of that person's birth and then the date of the date when that person died, right? Now, in between those fixed points is a dash, right? There's a dash. Now, you know what that dash represents? It represents our time while we are alive on earth. And it's very, very short. It is an appropriate symbol of the brevity of life. The Bible likens life as a vapor, a mist, a puff of smoke here this moment, gone the next. And we never know how much time we have left. An overly disturbed woman called up his, her, his, her doctor and said, Doctor, I'd just like to clarify the prescription you gave me yesterday, the medication, am I supposed to take that the rest of my life? And the doctor said, yes, you have to take that for the rest of your life. There was a moment of silence and then the woman continued. So I'm just wondering how serious my condition is. Because the prescription says, no refills. In the text we are studying in 1 Peter, the apostle mentions the brevity of life and the uncertain period of time we have left on earth. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 4. Especially, I'd like you to focus on verse 2, where it says the rest of their earthly lives. And then in verse 7, it says the end of all things is near. How long do you think is the rest of your earthly life? How long do you think you have left on planet earth? I don't know mine and neither do you know yours. But this we know. It's shorter than it was yesterday. Right? You remember that man who called up his doctor or who he went to a doctor, his doctor for a medical checkup. Two days later, the doctor called him and said, I have bad news for you, sir. What is it? And the doctor said, you only have 48 hours to live. What? Oh my God, that's bad news. But I have worse news than that, the doctor said. What worse could there be than what you already told me? And the doctor said, I tried to call you since yesterday. <laughs> Life is short. The apostle Peter says, the end of all things is near. So the question in light of this fact is, how then shall we live? That's the title of our message today. Life is short. The end of all things is near. So how then shall we live? In Psalm chapter 90, the the and Moses, after describing the shortness of life, prayed, Lord, teach us to number our days so that we might gain the heart of wisdom. Peter says, the end of all things is near. 
Life is so short. And the short time is running out. Therefore, don't be foolish by living your life in pursuit of personal selfish desires. Rather, live your lives wisely by pursuing God's desires. Amen? A firm belief in the brevity of life ought to drastically impact, first of all, our priorities, our perspective and priorities. Realizing that the end is near should change the way we look at life and the way we live our lives. If you know that you're going to die tomorrow, it should change your priorities, right? Amen? If you die tomorrow, it should change your priorities. A person who is dying on the hospital bed would never say, I wish I spent more time in the office. Now, perhaps he would say, I wish I spent more time with my wife and children. In other words, the reality of death makes us realize what is really important in life. Amen? You know why our priorities are out of place? It's because our focus is on the wrong place. It's on the temporal things, not on the eternal. And that is why we spend our time and effort running after things that don't last. We accumulate possessions and build ourselves monuments for the praise of the world. But that is wrong thinking. That is unwise living, incorrect living, in fact. Why? Because everything in this world is going to perish. Amen? And so, at the end of your life, what do you really have? What do you really have? Nothing. All the year's effort amounts to nothing. But if we devote ourselves to live for the praise of God, not for men, if we give ourselves fully to God, if we connect everything we do from Monday to Saturday with everything that God does or is doing in our community, in our church, and in the world, then all our efforts are not lost because it will be rewarded by God in heaven. Jesus makes that promise, amen? He calls it treasures in heaven. Jim Elliot was a missionary to the indigenous people in Ecuador in the 1950s. But these people killed him together with four other missionaries. And one of his lasting words were, he is no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He's no fool to give up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, the apostle Paul says, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. You see, if our life concerns is that we just pour ourselves to acquire things and to build monuments here on earth, then death is never going to be gained. In fact, it's a loss. Because when we die, it means that you leave everything behind that is precious and important to you. Amen? If Jesus Christ is not the center of our lives here and now, then the moment we die, we leave what is dear and valuable to us on earth. But if Christ is the center of our life here and now, we don't leave everything. We take everything with us in heaven. Amen? Heaven matters most to those who have put the most into it. Isn't it? I mean, you really look forward to heaven if you've already amassed treasures there in heaven. Amen? Amen? You really really look forward to your life after this life if you already have something ahead of you. Heaven 
If we firmly believe in heaven, then we can believe that dying is gain. There's another impact that knowing the shortness or the brevity of life. Second, it should change our attitude towards sin. God's word says that every man and woman born into this world is born a sinner. We've inherited the sinful nature of our first parents, Adam and Eve. That is why we are proud and selfish. Correct? Amen? Only a few said amen. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You're not part of humanity. <laughs> I am. I have the propensity to be proud and selfish, self-centered. That is why even uh, what we call love is actually self-interest repackaged to look like love. When we say, I love you, we're not really intent to making that person happy. It's because there is something in that person that makes us happy. Well, when we become Christians, this propensity to sin, this pride, this selfishness, this self-centeredness can be overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit in us. This is the miracle of the new birth, amen? This is the miracle of the new creation, of being born again. When you make Jesus a Savior and Lord, he gives you a, a new nature, his nature, a godly nature that is able to overcome our sinful nature. And that is why, whereas before, we easily give in to temptation. Now, as Christians, we can say no to temptation. And surely, but slowly but surely, we begin to hate sin instead of loving sin. Because God hates sin. If you're a Christian, then you love God. Amen? That's the nature or mark of a Christian. You love God. And if you love God, then you hate what God hates. You love what God loves and hate what God hates. And this is how the Apostle Peter put it. Verse 1, therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, why did Jesus die on the cross? Because of sin. So why would you love something that killed the God you say you love? Do you see the point? Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Why would you love that something that killed the God you said you love? That's why arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And Peter says there's another reason why we should hate sin. Hate sin because of its consequences. Verse 3 again. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans or unbelievers or before you were Christians. You have spent enough time in the past doing these things like what? Living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness. Orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Now just look at these sins in this verse and think about the consequences of these sins if we do any of them. Look at that. Devouchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Think about the consequences if we do any of, of, of these sins. Can you see shame? Can you see shame in there? Can you see broken homes and broken families and broken relationships? Can you see children, innocent children suffering? Can you see them? Can you see loss of respect of oneself and from others? Can you see loss of peace and joy? Can you see loss of usefulness in the kingdom of God? Regret, depression, even physical illness. There's a story of three women who died in a car crash on their way to lunch one Sunday from church. Uh, not this church. 
Just let me clarify that. It's just a story. <laughs> but there's a point, okay? Uh, there's a point. As they approached the pearly gates, the story goes, St. Peter welcomed them and said, before I allow you to enter these gates and into heaven, you must first live around this area for a year. But there is one important rule you must adhere and remember, don't step on the ducts. The women nodded their understanding and walked around only to discover that there were ducks walking around everywhere. They tried their best to avoid them, but within an hour, one of the ladies accidentally stepped on one. It gave out a loud quack, and whereupon St. Peter instantly appeared and shackled her to eternity, chained to the ugliest man she ever saw. And Peter said, you must spend the rest of eternity chained to this man. Later the same day, the second lady had the misfortune of stepping on a duck. Again, it's the duck quack. <laughs> and summon Saint Peter, who chained her for all time to a man even uglier than the first. The third lady, determined to avoid the first two ladies' fates, watched every step she took to avoid stepping on any duck. Barely several months, she was successful. And yet, out of nowhere, Peter appeared. And chained her to a man whose ugliness defied all descriptions. Before she could complain, Peter vanished. Confused, she turned to the man and asked, why was I chained to you? The man shrugged and said, I have no idea. All I did was step on a duck. <laughs> the point is, sin has consequences. Sin itself. Sin advertises itself as fun and exciting. But the price is pain and suffering. The problem with sin is that after we've finished committing sin, sin is not finished with us yet. We pay for sin in terms of a guilty conscience, of shame. We pay for sin in terms of embarrassment for our family, our friends, and for our church. In October of 1974, there was a heavyweight boxing match held in Zaire, a country in Africa. I don't, some of you probably remember this. It was called the Rumble in the Jungle. And it featured two of the best heavyweight boxers of the day. Anyone remember? Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Muhammad Ali was good, but Foreman was better. In fact, all the punters, the gamblers, bet on Foreman to win. But Muhammad Ali did something in that fight that no other fighter had ever dared to try before. He called it his rope-a-dope strategy. Essentially, when Foreman uh, closed in on him, punched on him, he just leaned back against the ropes, hold his arms around his face, and allow Foreman to simply box him. It went on for eight rounds. He absorbed Foreman's best blows. For eight solid rounds, Foreman beat and beat on Ali, becoming more, and he became more and more tired and weary. And then towards the end of the eight, Ali let go with a flurry of blows that dropped Foreman to the floor, knocking him out. Muhammad Ali won the fight, but it actually was Foreman who beat himself. He punched and punched and punched, until he got so tired, all Muhammad Ali had to do was deliver the final blow. That's what we do when we sin. We beat ourselves up. We become our own worst enemy. Hate sin. It's your protection. Amen? Amen. There's another reason why we should hate sin. Verse 4 to 6, hate sin because of accountability. Verse 4, it says, They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living, and they heap abuse on you. The pronoun they represents the former friends we had before we were Christians. They were our companions in sin. They were our drinking bodies. 
They were our addict friends. They were our gambling associates. They were our partners in morality and devotery. And they find it strange why you have broken away from them. They find it strange that you no longer hang out with them and do those things with them as you did before. At first, they would try to bring you back to your old sinful ways. Oh, come on. Just one drink. For the road. <laughs> For old time's sake. Come on, man. Come on. One sniff of cocaine, man. <laughs> come on. There's this, there's this young woman who didn't have the willpower to, wait, to lose weight. One day, her friend passed by her house and she lamented to her mother, Linda is so skinny, she makes me sick. And the mother said, well, if you're worried about it, why don't you do something about it? And the, lady, the young lady said, yes, you're right, good idea, mom. And so he called her friend, Linda, why don't you have a piece of chocolate cake? <laughs> She did something about it. It's like the woman who prayed, Lord, if you cannot make me thin, look, make others look fat. <laughs> That's how it is. If they can entice us to go back to our old sinful ways, they'll begin to resent you. They're not just going to unfriend you in their Facebook account. They're going to delete your name in their, from their mobile phone and they'll begin to talk about or against you. Why? Because your life is a rebuke to them. Your righteousness highlights their sin, the errors of their life, and they don't like that. And so, as Peter says, they will heap abuse on you. Ah, he's gone mad. He's reading the Bible, he's got religion. Made him crazy. You know, we live in a strange world with strange people. People don't think that, people don't find it strange when we destroy our lives by cigarettes and drink and drugs. In fact, the more you do it, the cooler you are. Oh, cool, man. You're cool as ice. Yeah. People don't find it strange when we commit sexual immorality and destroy our future homes and families and relationships. People don't find it strange when we destroy our lives by jumping from one sin to another. But let a man who, is, who was a drunkard become sober. Or an immoral person become moral and pure. And even the family would think he's gone crazy. Strange, isn't it? When we were bad to them, we were good. Now that we're good, we're bad. We live in a strange world with strange people. The Apostle Paul, or rather Peter says, never mind if they mock you. Never mind if they think you're crazy or a fool because you're a fool for God. One day, he said, they will be held to account for all their words and deeds. Verse 5. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. Many people reject the idea of judgment. They have no problem accepting a God who loved them and forgave their sins, but they have a problem with a God who will judge them. They have no problem celebrating the birth of Jesus, the Savior of the world, but they can accept that Jesus is coming again to judge the world. Not because, they de their denial is not because it's hard to explain or to understand these truths in the Bible, but because it interferes with their sinful lifestyle. You see, it's the same reason they reject creation. The same reason they reject consummation. You see, if there is a God who created the world, then ultimately they will be held accountable by that God. Amen? That's why they'll just reject that idea. 
because they don't want to be held accountable. But whether they believe in God or not, it doesn't change the fact that there's going to be a day of accountability, a day of judgment. One day, everyone will stand in front of God, our creator, and be held accountable for every thought, words, and actions that we have done on planet Earth. Amen? There was this church who had a picnic, and everyone was invited to the community. And the pastor placed a basket of apple on one end of the table, and the other end was a basket of cookies. On the basket of apple, the pastor placed a note. And it says, take one apple only, God is watching. On the other end, the, ba the, the basket of cookies, a child placed a sign that says, take all the cookies you want, God is watching the apple. It's not childish but foolish if we think we can get away with our sins, right? Amen? We can't get away with anything. Even if your mom and your, mo your father doesn't know. Even if no one knows, God knows. Amen? God knows. And accountability means that each individual person, each one of us, will be held accountable for our actions, thoughts, and deeds. They're not going to hold accountable your mother, your father. They will be held accountable for their own actions, thoughts, and deeds. But we will be held accountable for ours. Amen? Not our friends, not our teachers, not society, not the environment, not even Satan. But you. I'm responsible before God. I'm answerable before God. I'm accountable to God. Listen, you're going to die alone. I'm going to die alone. Death is something that you can't share it with. Correct? I preached to you in a lot of funeral before in my time in ministry. And it's just the departed person in that coffin. You will die alone. That means you will face God alone. You can't bring your mother alone. Lord, can I bring my mother? I think she's more Christian than I am. No, you can't. God will hold you personally accountable Amen. as if you're the only person in the whole world. Amen. That's why in the light of all this truth we have heard, we should not be foolish and play around with sin. Rather, we should get rid of sin as the day of accountability draws near. Amen? Amen? Now in this passage, the Apostle Peter doesn't just tell us about the consequences and implications of sin. He also provides us an effective way to win against sin. Verse 1, once again. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. In the King James Version, it says, arm yourselves with the same mind. Because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. The verb arm implies an urgent and immediate call to do so. Peter is commanding us to adopt the mindset of Christ as we strive to win against sin. Why the mind? Because right living always begins with right thinking. Amen? Proverbs, as a man thinks that he is. Holy living always starts with holy thinking. Righteous living always starts with righteous thinking. That's why to win the battle, it must be won in the thought life. Amen? It all begins here. Before we act, no one sins, commits the sin before committing it here. Amen? Amen? That's why this is where the battle starts, in the mind. And how are we going to do it? How are we going to win this battle against sin? Pray? Of, of course, absolutely. We need to pray. But we need to do more than that. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. 
says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. It's good, pleasing, and perfect will. Paul doesn't say, just pray that God will renew your mind. Just pray, okay? No, he says, you must renew your mind. Don't just pray, Lord, please renew my mind. It's the same way as saying, Mom, can you do my homework for me? Now, some parents might do that, but responsible parents would not do that. No, responsible parents would tell their child, no, you do it yourself. So you learn. God will not renew your mind for you because it's your mind. Amen? We must be responsible for renewing our minds. He says, renew your mind. So how are we going to do this? First, we must clean out and block out all sources of sinful thoughts. Clean out and block out all sources of sinful thoughts. If we want to have a pure thought life, so we can live pure lives, then we must clean out all the cobwebs, all the sinful, evil, sensual, sexual thought in our minds. If we don't do that, it's like trying to clean ourselves, and yet we are inside a mud hole. Correct? First, you must get out of that mud hole, then wash yourself with soap and water. If we allow things in our lives that promote sensuality, greed, pride, selfishness, crude language, we cannot grow in holiness and righteousness and we cannot get rid of sin. Second, filter your thoughts with God's word. Amen? First, clean out, black out all sources of thought and then filter your thoughts with God's word. If I tell you, don't think of a submarine right now. Are you sure you're not thinking of submarine? <laughs> Don't think of a submarine right now. Okay, Don't think. I think you're thinking of a submarine. <laughs> so if you don't want to think of a submarine, the way is not to think. Not to think of a submarine, but to think about something else. Amen? If you don't want to have bad thoughts, it's not that you don't want to think of bad thoughts, but rather you immerse your thoughts with God's word. God's thoughts, good thoughts. And this is why it's so important to read your Bible daily. Amen? Amen? You may not read the newspaper every day, but you must read the Bible daily in order, as Paul would say, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Saturate your mind with the word of God. Let the word of God be the screen or sift, if you will, of all these thoughts that may come to our minds. We can't help sometimes what thoughts come to our minds, right? But with the word of God, it's like screening it, blocking it, if you will, before it ever resides in our minds. That's how we renew our minds. We cannot be profoundly influenced by something that we don't know. That is why if we are to be influenced by God's word, we must know God's word. The more you fill your mind with God's word, the more you cleanse your thoughts with unclean things. Amen. An old Indian was explaining to a missionary that the battle inside of him was like a black, black dog fighting against a white dog. And the missionary asked, which dog wins? The Indian replied, the one I feed the most. Which dog wins? Your sinful nature or God's nature in you? The one you feed the most. Feed your godly nature. Feed 
your new nature with God's word and you will be successful and victorious against sin and temptation. Think scripture and you will think like Christ. And then you begin to hate the lies and love the truth. You begin to love God, hate sin. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we know that we are a product in progress. We are not finished with us yet. And even the renewing of our minds, where you are still at it. We're still at it. That's why we are here. Listening to your message. That's why we read your word every day. So that your word may saturate our minds. Filter our thoughts. So that our minds, our thoughts, our thinking life is purified so that we may live pure, holy lives. Father, if there are those of us who are struggling with such thoughts, unclean, sensual, sexual thoughts, even thoughts of anger and bitterness, hatred, I pray, Lord, that you would speak to them, convict them, if you will, at this very moment. Remind them, Lord, that you are a God who will forgive our sins if we confess it. And you are able to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, purify us, and make us worthy again before you. I pray, Lord, that if there are those of us who are struggling in this area with the thought life, There is a miracle today. That Lord, as they go home, they would be delivered by all these things. Help us to love you more so that we would hate sin more. Because we cannot love you and love sin at the same time. We know, Father, that you telling us these things is not so to take away the joy in our life but to actually experience more joy in our lives because Lord we know we've experienced that all of us have experienced that the consequences of our sins we know how it feels like the shame, the regret the depression the uselessness the embarrassment the loss of respect personal respect and respect from others. We know how it feels like the consequence, the pain of the consequences of our sins. So we know, Lord, that when you're telling us this, you're simply protecting us because you love us. Help us to understand that and move accordingly, live accordingly to your will. Father, thank you again for your message. Thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful. As always, oh God, you're faithful in bringing me to this point every Sunday, delivering your message. You're faithful in providing for other needs that your people have, physical, mental, relational, financial, and now spiritual needs. Thank you so much, Lord. That's why the glory and the honor and the praise belong to no one else but to you alone, Lord Jesus. In your name we praise and all this we ask in your name amen